it, it's a special day for me because a long, long time ago, I did my membership exams here. So I'm actually a member of the Royal College of Physicians of Edinburgh, and this is my first revisit. So it's special. It's special also because you're a fantastic audience. You've been listening, and I hope this has been valuable. And I hope that my whistle-stop tour around mindfulness is of value for you. Um, I did 35 years uh, in the NHS, and I'm now retired from the NHS, but I work um, uh, running a um, hypermobility clinic at the one hospital in Ashford in Kent. I'm lucky enough to teach medical students, and I'll bring that into my talk because I think, I think the future is going to be how we uh, get the next generation of doctors uh, understanding a little bit uh, more about medically unexplained symptoms. I think that's absolutely crucial. Um, and I'm a medical advisor and trustee to the Hypermobility Syndromes Association, uh, which you'll be familiar with. So um, just to start off, to emphasize that mindfulness does several important things. It helps to treat anxiety and depression, helps you make better choices, improves resilience, helps prevent and aids recovery from burnout, and improves sleep. I should just say that I'm, I'm not a mindfulness teacher. I'm a champion for mindfulness, and that's why I'm here, really. Okay, so it is defined as being in the moment using guided meditation, and I'm sure that you'll all be familiar with the origins uh, of mindfulness. And really, when we're thinking about being in the moment, um, the attention span of a goldfish is nine seconds. Would anyone like to make a, a judgment about what the human being attention span is? Just, just wake up, anyone? 12 seconds, 12 seconds. So we, we, we're not, not that much better than goldfish. Um, and, you know, because of this, or looking at our phones, what are you missing? And this guy's out on his boat. He's, he's being in a nice, tranquil place, but he's missing this beautiful whale floating past because he's more interested in his phone than the surroundings. Okay. Now, I'm going to talk about ways in which we can be mindful because mindfulness is not a panacea. Uh, nobody ever said it was, but um, some people, some of your friends, may be naturally mindful. They don't need any assistance whatsoever with their mental well-being. Uh, but the most of what I'll be talking about now, briefly, is mindful meditation. Um, but it's obvious that there are other ways of being mindful. I just want to run through that uh, in terms of exercise, um, walking, running, cycling, swimming. For some people, going to a quiet place, such as a church or an art gallery, and with music, um, particularly um, singing, uh, and there's good evidence that, that that's good for postnatal depression, in case you weren't aware. So if you have a baby and you're getting a bit low, join a choir, um, there's evidence that that works. And then there's hobbies like uh, fishing, painting, and golf. And uh, I'm gonna be mentioning new evidence about Tai Chi. Um, I'm gonna talk to you about mindful self-compassion. And then I'm going to introduce you, Julius, here to talk about the Alexander Technique but all of these um, modalities in your toolbox um, really are about aiming for replenishment and relaxation. Those are the two aspects of life that make it worth living. Um, and it's a question of finding out what works for you. But I don't, I don't need to tell you that. We've heard about that earlier. That's, everyone's got their own way through this uh, predicament. But for me, uh, my replenishment is playing bass guitar. I play in a band. Um, and we go out and we play at hospital balls and things and fundraisers, and that's good fun. But my relaxation would be, oh, it's moving. <laughs> <laughs> so um, that's in the Lake District walking um, just recently. And, and that's, uh, you know, getting out and about in the air, it's good for you, um, the fresh air. So just moving on. Mindfulness is about being in the moment, and we've, you know, we'll be hearing from Chad a little bit later about um, you know, uh, talking therapies, but, but some people have had enough of that and don't want to go over again uh, you know, the traumas of their childhood. And, and the beauty of mindfulness is, is about being in the moment. It's not about um, uh, your childhood, and it's not about you know, where you're going, really. It's about being in the moment, and, and that training is very good for the mind, and we'll, we'll see how that works in just a minute. So just dwelling on how anxiety, which we talked about earlier, um, creates a lot of unhelpful thinking patterns, um, catastrophization, procrastination, negative thinking, demotivation, a busy brain. Anyone got a busy brain in here? Mm, yes, and sleep disturbance, okay. So, um, and then of course, 
the importance of the physical symptoms that go with anxiety, because anxiety can create um, practically any symptom, including palpitations, sweating, trembling, nausea, chest pains, shortness of breath, brain fog, and insomnia. And, and in, in defense of you know, my colleagues who uh, uh, are seeing uh, you for the first time, uh, they've got to kind of unpick this group of symptoms uh, from those related to your hypermobility. So it is a, it is a, a daunting task, and I'm lucky now, now to have time to do that uh, in my practice, but it's not easy uh, for a rheumatologist who's given 30 minutes for a new patient uh, to do justice. So I'm going to talk to you about the Mindful Nation report. Is anyone aware of this report? Uh, it came out in 2015. Okay, it's from the government. They did something useful. This was before we had Brexit. Um, it's a milestone. It was an all-party parliamentary group, and 186 MPs have now undertaken the eight-week training course. Um, and and, and the, the report... Um, led to certain key recommendations um, in four areas. In health, they recommended that mindfulness-based cognitive therapy should be available for mental health conditions and chronic conditions, and that NICE should review the evidence around irritable bowel syn syndrome, cancer, and chronic pain. And then we talked earlier, uh, I heard earlier, about the education teaching of mindfulness in schools, and then the bit about workplace, which is particularly close to my heart, occupational health issues such as stress, uh, work-related rumination, fatigue, and disrupted sleep. And I, I work with East Kent Hospitals uh, on a resilience program to help with this, um, to combat stress and to improve organizational effectiveness. For example, Google have embedded that entirely in their ethos. And then finally, the criminal justice system. Uh, we know we've got lots of people incarcerated and they could very usefully learn mindfulness techniques uh, as part of their rehabilitation. So my journey with the Mindfulness Initiative took me to the Houses of Parliament to meet um, uh, Craig Hassad. Um, and he's, uh, has anyone heard of Craig Hassad? Yeah, yeah, great, very interesting. So go on YouTube and have a look at Craig, but actually I'm gonna give you a little taster in a minute with a video from him. Um, but um, we're, we're going to look really about his Monash experience. Craig was, was clever enough to make a business case that took 5% of the undergraduate curriculum at Monash for medicine uh, and apply it to mindfulness and resilience. Uh, and the business case was around student well-being, building resilience, enhancing empathy, compassion, and communication, integrating my biomedical, psychological, and social sciences, and the most important point, laying foundations for future clinical skills, because I think we've all agreed that the clinical skills when it relation, in relation to hypermobility uh, aren't there at the moment, the knowledge is not there. And uh, as a result, when his project was evaluated, doctors were coming out, they were much more resilient, uh, empathic, compassionate, and they weren't leaving medicine. In this country at the moment, people are dropping medicine, they are leaving the country, they are not sure about which pathway to follow. So I'm going to hopefully give you four minutes of Craig Hassad, and then I'm gonna come back and wrap up. So here we go. Oh no, firstly, a question, I knew I'd get this wrong, okay. Um, is mindfulness your cup of tea? Can I just uh, have a show of hands? Okay, so we're, we're, we're pretty much un, un, treating, uh, preaching to the converted, but let's hear what Craig's got to say. My name's uh, Associate Professor Craig Hassard and I work at Monash University, based originally in the Department of General Practice. Mindfulness is very simple. It has to do with paying attention to present moment to our life as it unfolds, but also uh, cultivating an attitude with which we pay attention. Researchers and psychologists start to adapt mindfulness to help people with um, chronic and relapsing depression. And when those studies started to come out showing major reductions in relapse rates, um, other people start to take it seriously. And, and literally on the back of the research, it's, um, it's just gone up exponentially since the early 2000s. To the point that, say, last year alone, 2016, um, there were just under 700 um, new papers published in refereed medical and psychological journals. One of the interesting things and the challenging thing for people to understand is how mindfulness can have profound effects on our physical health. Now, to understand that, we need to understand a little bit about the fight or flight response. So for a short period of time, we're faster and we're stronger and we'll have more endurance than we normally have. Now, the unfortunate thing is that when we're not mindful, we often activate that response when we don't really need it. 
So one of the people to really put this on the map, the, uh, the chronic effect of this overactivation of the response was McEwen, and he described what he called allostatic load, physiological wear and tear, like flogging the car day in, day out. And that's associated with uh, a poor immune function. We get less defense against coughs, colds, infections, we're more likely to get sick during periods of high stress, but we get more inflammation, the technical terms, immune dysregulation. Um, it, metabolic effects, blood pressure, blood glucose, blood lipids um, are out of whack. Um, uh, we, it thins our bones. Um, it um, increases the rate of um, atherosclerosis, the hardening of the arteries that leads to heart attacks and strokes and so on. If we wanted to accelerate aging, this is how to do it. But it damages the brain as well. So these stress chemicals day in, day out, damage areas that are very important, like the hippocampus, so that's our learning and memory center of the brain, and the prefrontal cortex, so that's working memory and executive function. These are our higher functions. And damaging those areas of the brain is not what we want to do. The effects of this high activation of the stress response and so on, you know, psychological, emotional stress, has even been um, found to go right down to the DNA of our cells. And so Elizabeth Blackburn, an Australian woman who won the Nobel Prize for Medicine in 2009 for discovering telomeres, she and her team, um, Elisa Apple, um, particularly prominent among her team, um, have found that um, overactivating this response uh, accelerates the um, ageing process as measured by DNA um, in terms of telomere length. So we can be about a decade older by middle age if we've got high levels of anger and hostility and stress and, and so on compared to somebody who might have the same situation in life but is getting less stressed and reactive over them. The interesting thing is when we practice being more mindful then it switches off these dif distracted default circuits. It engages the sensory areas and the attention centers of the brain. And when we're sitting down practicing mindfulness meditation, those centers in our brain are getting a workout. And it's like they're going to the gym, right? <laughs> they're lifting some weights, they're on the treadmill. It starts to have a whole range of positive effects on the health. So we get immune regulation. So better immunity, we're less likely to get sick with coughs, colds, infections, it switches off excessive inflammation. Uh, takes stress off the cardiovascular system, switches down cortisol, all the damage that it has on the bones. Elizabeth Blackburn and her team have been doing work on that in a whole series of studies that started, the first one published in 2009, that showed that mindfulness switched on the repair enzyme uh, called telomerase and has been found to slow down the rate of aging down to the DNA of the cells. And if that was a drug, that would be a blockbuster drug. So um, mindfulness training therefore enables you to regulate attention, focus, control, self-mastery, to regulate your emotions, to reduce that fight and flight freeze response, reduces your perceived stress, you take a more positive view, um, and better perspective taking. I mean, if you're in pain, one of the things that mindfulness is, is, is going to do, if it's successful, is take you away from it being in control as to you being able to just take a, a little bit of distance. And that's not to say that it's going to obliterate pain, but I'll show you some evidence around there in a minute. And then, of course, enhancing your learning and memory processing. So all of these things, these are not things that I dreamt up on the way to the talk. Uh, there's evidence around this, and um, strong evidence internationally. Um, so when you meditate, there are immediate changes in cortical activity. In the long term, changes in the hippocampus and the amygdala, which we've um, heard from other speakers. And I, I won't dwell on this process of mindful meditation, except to say that when you are meditating, you are trying to listen to the guided talk, uh, and then your mind will wander. Uh, but the process is bringing your thinking back, so you're training your brain uh, to come back uh, to um, have less mind wandering. Uh, but this is a, a kind of day seminar in itself, what's in that slide, so we'll, we'll move on. Um, so how do we learn to be mindful? The gold standard way is to go on an eight-week MBSR course, um, or you can read, or you can look at apps, or look at the online resources. And um, so the eight-week course, I think, has anyone done an eight-week course here? Okay, there's a, there's a good number, good number. Um, looking forward, attention in the moment, awareness. We're talking about improving relationships with each other, and we're talking about caring. The Headspace and the Calm apps are available. Um, those, uh, I, I recommend those to the medical students uh, who are about to go on the wards. They can be very helpful, or the junior doctors. 
And then some, there's so much to read, really. Um, I, I recommend the Mark Williams book, um, but if you like a bit of um, humor and you like Ruby Wax, um, although Ruby is bipolar, um, she's now a mental health ambassador, and there's lots of interesting tips and perspectives in her book. Um, and then um, if you want to go and learn to be a mindfulness teacher or more about it, there's excellent courses like the Oxford Mindfulness Center Summer School. And internationally, the Mindfulness Summit who has all the great and the good that you'll have heard of. Um, that's a fantastic resource. Um, but I want to just sort of come to uh, sort of close um, really just by mentioning mindful self-compassion because there's more to meditation. Uh, mindful self-compassion is something that we've used in East Kent hospitals as a five-week course, uh, and it's multidisciplinary, um, so people get an opportunity to talk to each other, and it's very effective, strong evidence base. Um, self-compassion is a combination of mindfulness, which um, uh, is recognizing when we're stressed or struggling without being judgmental or overreacting. Um, self-kindness, being supportive and understanding towards ourselves when we're going through a hard time rather than being harshly self-critical. And then the connectedness, remembering that everyone makes mistakes and experiences difficulties at times. We're not alone. And it's particularly useful, I expect there are lots of you here who are perfectionists, for whom life is very difficult if you just can't do it the way you would like to, but it's very good at coming uh, to help you with that. And here we are, here's um, uh, Christian Neff and Chris Germer. They've done a lot of the scientific work, which is very powerful. And um, Chris Germer's coming to London on November the 22nd. I'm going to see him, two-day course for those who are interested. So this is um, in interesting, and it comes back to this point that's been made earlier. Um, really, we, you've got to be able to look after yourself before you can look after your family or friends, and therefore put your oxygen mask on first, uh, and, and that, that, that point's been well made by other speakers. So um, let's just very, I'm going to wrap it up now, but mindfulness in the context of a chronic painful condition, um, fibromyalgia, which you'll be familiar with, um, the point is that we can now image it. You know, no longer is it some you know, ill-defined process. Um, we can image it. And we can also, um, when we meditate, uh, this is a functional MRI image, um, we can show uh, that the, the meditation is changing the relationship with pain. Uh, and this image shows the change in brain pattern. The brain has got amazing neural plasticity, which gives me reason for hope that everyone uh, can get some benefit from looking at their pain management in this way. So moving on quickly, um, we all know that for fibromyalgia and um, a lot of hypermobile patients, uh, medications are not particularly effective, and certainly it's, it's true with fibromyalgia. But uh, we did know that aerobic exercise for those who can exercise is helpful. But here is this paper which shows that Tai Chi is twice as effective. So why might Tai Chi be twice as effective? Well, it's mindful. Um, it's doing things as a group, which is always good for your soul. Um, and um, it, it's, it just allows you to get into a space um, where you're exercising, so it can help your kinesiophobia. So in summary, mindfulness does several important things. It treats anxiety and depression, helps you make better choices, improves resilience, helps prevent and aids recovery from burnout, and improves sleep. And this takes me on to something which I'm very interested in and why I'm glad that Julia is here, Julia Woodman, uh, is about the Alexander Technique. And I, um, this is more about movement, but it's, it's much more to it than I, I don't want to do it a disservice by describing it as movement and posture. It's much more than that. And um, really for me, um, having had a, a career where I'm doing, you know, on the bottom right there, sitting at a computer in a slumped posture, um, I've found, mindfulness, uh, I've found um, Alexander Technique lessons really helpful. Um, and, uh, of course, we've got this problem with the iPhone uh, having a really negative effect uh, on your cervical posture. All of these things need to be thought about, and we need to rethink uh, the way we move. Uh, and so um, the paper there uh, in the BMJ talks about Alexander and lumbar pain. It works. There's 600 patients in there, and it lasts. Yeah? Anyone been to a physiotherapist and had a good couple of weeks and then it all comes back? You know, that's not uncommon. Um, and then uh, the second paper, uh, which is much larger, uh, is for neck pain. 
and this is the Atlas study, and I think uh, Julia will be starting to talk about uh, a little bit of that in a minute. Uh, but the third area, which is um, Parkinson's disease, which is a, a mood, uh, a movement disorder, uh, NICE have recommended Parkin um, Alexander technique lessons for Parkinson's disease. So you're going to find out a little bit more about it now from Julia, uh, and thank you for listening. I welcome back our speakers, please. Um, it's Phil and Linda here. And Alan, thank you. Um, if anyone has messaged uh, Dr. Hakeem directly, he hasn't been able to see them because he's been busy at Hedge all day. So either resend them to the, on the subject or stand up by microphone because we, I won't be able to see those messages. Okay, we'll start over here in the centre. Thank you. Hi. <laughs> I work as a psychodynamic psychotherapist, so I work with childhood, adverse childhood experiences. Um, I also have HSD, and I have a concern in my work about um, GPs referring clients for anxiety and depression. And because I have what I have, I'm able to work out that the symptoms, some of the symptoms they get are physical and not, are not mental. So the concern is if I didn't know what I knew, there would be some therapists carrying on with the whole anxiety. And I'm not saying there's not anxiety there, I'm talking about specific symptoms. And when I've said to my clients, go back and see your doctor, because that's not an anxiety symptom. It's, it, from my, I've been doing this 15 years now, so I work out what's what. They go back to the doctor, I say, you need, to, you need to go back and get a referral to find out what this is. And they find out what it is, and they come back and say, yeah, it's um, some problem in my stomach, and it refers to EDS or HSD. So I just wonder if you've had those experiences, and how do you get the message through to GPs or any other medic that they're causing problems there by just assuming that their clients have anxiety when they don't. Oh, we go. Um, that ha that happens all the time, actually. Oh, That's really good. And because, in a sense, GPs are not so good with chronic pain, medically unexplained symptoms. Um, at the, at, with chronic pain, the best that they can do is, you know, often give painkillers. So it's very difficult. So they're always looking for somebody to um, shed some more light on it. And I suppose I think it's our job to think about, okay, you know, we've done an assessment, we think some of this is physical, and maybe it's our job actually to um, contact the GP, send a letter back, and by doing that, we're educating the GPs. You know, sometimes I go, you know, where I work in my NHS practice in Kingston, you know, I go to the GP kind of like seminars and I talk about kind of like EDS because I'm just trying to increase their, their knowledge of it. But in terms of their training, they wouldn't have had anything on EDS. So um, I think it's, again, it's one of those things where we're slowly educating people through lots of different means. But I suppose we do have to take on the task of actually educating the GPs. It does work. So, uh, absolutely concur. It happens all the time, every day, every clinic. That's that 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 story. Um, uh, the and it, and it should work both ways. So, if I see somebody who comes in and um, uh, much of what we discuss is a realization that there are lots of psychological issues and maybe less on the physical, then I should be able to just have a completely normal, mature conversation with somebody from psychology or psychiatry, wherever the support's needed, to say, we need some help and we need to work together to, you know, uh, to support this person. So it works both ways. But the thing that I find the most distressing, to be honest, um, is when somebody is sent to a psychologist or a psychiatrist, and the psychologist or the psychiatrist says, fundamentally, this is not a psychological or psychiatric problem. It's a physical problem. And when the individual goes back to see the doctors, they completely disbelieve the report of the psychologist or the psychiatrist and continue to pursue this avenue of it being a psychiatric issue. And I just do not understand that at all. 
So that tells me that in those sorts of situations, this experience and understanding of the, uh, of the physical issues is just completely lacking. They just don't have the skills. Now, um, I am the first person to say it's fine not to have the skills. It is not fine to ignore the fact that you don't have the skills and continue to pursue that pathway. It's completely inappropriate and it's bad for patients. We've got, we've got a long way to go. I've had two experiences of talking uh, in London to the Medically Unexplained Symptom National Group and also local psychiatrists. And it's very interesting just seeing how the pennies start to drop when you present the story that we have. And it does mean that we've got to do a lot of education. Um, we do, with the HMSA website, we have a meeting in a box that you could tell your GP about. Because we, what we think, I think we, we all agree that it has to start with GP education. That's where it's got to be, because a lot of the less severely affected individuals just want a diagnosis uh, and don't necessarily uh, need a lot of intervention. They just want to know, why have I got all these symptoms? Um, so I think the whole issue of somatization as a philosophy for psychiatrists is a big worry. Okay, question for, <coughs> yeah. Question for Alan. In using beta blockers, how about using something more specific such as antenolol that is beta-1 specific, easier on the lungs, and does not cross the blood-brain barrier, so it's non-sedative? The idea would be to break the feedback mechanism of perceived increases in heart rate, increasing symptoms of anxiety further. So who's been reading up on their beta-1 and beta-2 biology? Who, <laughs> <laughs> uh... <laughs> Well, no, I mean, absolutely. I mean, uh, atenolol is in there on the list. Um, uh, um, agents like metoprolol and bisoprolol are often used because they're actually better tolerated for the various types of side effects that they can be. But there's no reason why you can't use atenolol as a, as a perfectly reasonable beta blocker. Um, they've all got beta-1 activity, uh, and the first two have got some beta-2 activity. Um, so um, I don't know who asked the question, um, but it's perfectly reasonable to use atenolol. Um, uh, but um, it's it, thinking about agents that are used for beta blockade to control blood pressure in things like vascular, uh, EDS, um, metoprolol and bisoprolol you, uh, and soliprolol are the sort of more typical ones to go for because they've got much more multi-receptor activity. Thank you. And this is not a question but a comment that some people may find helpful. In addition to the BACP, the professional body for counsellors in Scotland is COSCA, Counselling and Psychotherapy in Scotland. They have a list of accredited counsellors on their website. Okay, bear with me, please, while I just go through the questions. Oh, hello. There we go. Go on. <laughs> Are we there now? Yeah. Um, can I just say that it's not very easy to stand up here and make this comment, but I'm going to do it anyway because... Um, there is a purpose for me, the same as everybody else, to be standing here. Um, I want to, to put to the panel just exactly um, what's your opinion on trauma induced by professionals to families out there that are struggling to get any help um, and support. Um, I was in a position myself um, after nine years of um, looking for assessment for my son, um, who did turn out in the end um, to be autistic, and it turned out that my other two children were also autistic, and I've been diagnosed myself. Um, in the process, four years ago, I went through a traumatic child protection situation, um, where it was assumed that it was my mental health that was the problem. And um, I've spent a long time trying to understand and comprehend how people can be put in the position that we are as parents when we are trying to get the best for our children and now in a position that are frightened to do so because of things that have been done to us in the past when you know, we've been in a position that we don't know how to handle it. Um, you know, I can be quite an articulate person, but I'm better writing things down than I am addressing things face to face. So I really want to put um, the question to you that 
there is families out there that find that they're completely in a position of being soul destroyed by prolonged outside agencies who appear to conspire but don't take ownership when proved wrong. Now, I was in that position and did nothing about it because I have no strength left anymore. I, I, well, all I wanted was an apology. I never got that. But I'm now in a position that all my autistic children show signs um, of hypermobility. And I'm in a position now that I am terrified to take it further because am I going to be subject to more stress? You know, there's kids out there that are suicidal, that have taken their lives because of professionals. And it's, it, there needs to be a time that this stops. People need to start listen, listening to parents, you know, because at the end of the day, we know our children better than anybody. That's, that's my lot, sorry. <laughs> Um, so, absolutely. And, you know, on the positive side, there, there, there are also doctors like this. And I think it doesn't, it doesn't excuse that because there are terrible, harrowing, unforgivable things happening to families out there in the UK and all over the world. Um, and this is an opportunity to, to mention um, that we are actually bringing together a round table of experts that will be meeting at the Royal Society of Medicine in London in April that are focusing on the paediatric issue that we are seeing all over the world. We're bringing together policymakers, members of the International Consortium, and members of the Paediatric uh, in, uh, International Consortium to try and tackle this head on, um, because it's not good enough. We need to make a difference. We're taking that challenge on, and we want to work together with everyone to try and make that better. Terrible trouble with buttons here. Um, I'd like to, we're, we're recording this, right? Yes. I would like your permission, if we may, to actually use the way you've asked your question today and uh, to take it to this meeting uh, as one of the examples of a real story um, with um, real compassion behind it. And I'd just like to, we'll check afterwards with you if you're all right with that, but I'd like to really thank you for asking that question. It's so pertinent. Um, I suppose in the meantime, I think, yeah, the way you asked that question was absolutely great. So I'd almost start there um, and think about going to your GP. And I've advised lots of people to do it. If, your GP, if you don't feel that your GP is helpful, unfortunately, I've had to ask a lot of people to try and change, change GPs. But really, if you can find one health advocate who is on your side who can understand and try and get that person to do as much as they can within the system, that would be really useful. I know that's not easy, but that's just one thing that you can do in the meantime before all this other stuff comes out. So I have a, with that, that uh, kind of depressing notion of that's going out there, something that is inspiring of someone that's tuning in saying, I work as a physiotherapist and I want to help these patients live a healthy, active, independent life. I often struggle to manage patients' expectations of what we can and cannot do. When I ask, many patients tell me they want me to take their pain away, or a doctor has told them they need to go to a gym. This must be terribly frustrating for patients. How can we as healthcare professionals better manage patients' expectations of treatment options of, for EDS and um, HSD? So there are people out there willing to help us, which is great. Can we have an attempt at an answer on that question? So how can we, how can healthcare professionals better manage a patient's expectations of treatment options for HSD? And better, your better, advice to a fellow professional. Better manage the expectations. Well, I suppose the first thing is to have a conversation with the, with the person that you're working with, your patient, as to what their expectations are. Uh, I think um, we spend a lot of our time uh, looking at the current functional issues, various symptom profiles, thinking about... Um, our own expectations of our own interventions, uh, goals to be set, 
Uh, are these goals realistic over a period of time? What are the more long-term goals? So if, I think if you don't start with those sorts of conversations, it be quite, can be quite easy to go a long way down a pathway and, and, and have realised that you've never actually set a set of expectations. Um, uh, I wonder actually whether how, how many people in the room have gone into the room to a clinic to a consultation with no expectation. Hands up if you've gone in with no expectation that anything was going to come out of it. Yeah. So you know, works both ways. There are um, a lot of hands up. There are lots of hands street. up. So so work um, work with your with, with with your patients to identify the expectations and be honest about um, uh, what you feel you can and can't uh, provide. Um, and equally for, 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 for patients, everybody in the community, have in your own mind what you feel your expectations are. It's okay if they're under, because if we think we can do more, we'll try and boost you. It's okay if they're over, because if they're over, we need to have a conversation and bring them back down to something that's a bit more realistic. It doesn't matter either way, you've just got to have the conversation. Absolutely. <laughs> Is psychotherapy still useful if the patient has little childhood memory? Yes. <laughs> yes. Um, if, if, yes, because there are ways of finding the memory. Um, so using EMDR or EFT, there's ways of finding that memory. Um, I haven't talked about it here, but also in... To some extent, hypnotherapy, you can find the memory. However, finding the memory is not necessarily um, so important. It's working with the present symptoms. So in the absence of the memory, um, what are the present symptoms? Um, and are there any other memories that can be remembered that feed into the problem? And so with the CBT approach, you're always trying to work with the here and now. How can the person cope in order to relieve their suffering and distress in the present? Yes. Thank you. Yeah, hi. Um, briefly, my work background is in mental health and um, both, both as a nurse and as a social worker. Um, Thirty odd years ago, I had what was thought to be a very minor accident and um, went to see an orthopaedic surgeon. I was told, can you bend over, touch your toes? Yeah, no problems. I mean, by this time, I was experiencing severe pain. I couldn't stand for more than about five seconds without blacking out. Um, as I said, saw this orthopedic surgeon, was told and asked, can I bend over, put my hands flat on the floor? Yeah, piece of cake, no problems whatsoever. Um, the report that I got from the orthopedic surgeon said, any pain this woman thinks she might feel is probably a psychological reaction to her husband's death, coupled with a little bit of paramedical knowledge. As a result, I lost my work, workplace pension. I had to give up work. Um, you know, sort of 35 years later, it's still impacting on my life because of the whole financial thing. And yeah, you know, it's just this whole transition from being a respected mental health professional to just becoming this woman. And you know, it, was, it was just an incredible experience. So yeah, I just, just wanted to sort of share that, that you know, sort of, it's, it's not always good. <laughs> no, it's, it's often not, and I'm, I'm afraid that I still uh, see people in clinic who, who come with those sorts of stories. And there's a couple of things that come to my mind in your, in, in, in your story. Uh, one, one is this, this perception that somehow, because you can move apparently more than normally, that you can't have sustained an injury it is, is nonsensical. Equally, we were talking about earlier on today how you can dislocate joints and it not be painful. Um, people who've got very unstable joints can dislocate their joints and it's not painful. Right. So, so there, there, there are all these misconceptions around how pain and the mobility and the impact on function somehow should both track with each other high levels of pain, clear evidence of, of, of reduced function. But the other, the, the other thing that I do, um, somebody who has that kind of story, is ask the question, who wrote those things about actually formal, correct assessment of the um, diagnosis that they made and the statement that they gave so that there was formal evidence that they'd worked this through. And I have to tell you that the vast majority of the time, the answer is no, they did not. 
And I have cases where people have been given various psychological diagnoses and there has been no formal assessment by that individual. Yeah, I, no I love my orthopaedic colleagues, but I doubt very much that any one of them would ever have the time and very few of them would ever have the knowledge to do a formal psychological or psychiatric assessment in that way. Mm -hmm. The problem is, at the professional level, when that's down on a letter by Mr. So-and-so, who's a very important person in the local hospital, we're in trouble. And um, uh, uh, right now I spend my time getting those statements off people's letters because it leads to the kind of trauma that you've just described. Hi. Um, it was two questions, if there is time. Um, the first one was to do with the gut and the psychological and emotional health. Um, how what we eat, how our diet can impact on that. It was just to get the feedback from the panel and what they think on that. Yeah, um, so this really brings us back, I, I think it's working, yeah. This brings us back to the issue of the microbiome um, and, you know, it, 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 everybody's got a different microbiome and everyone has a slightly different reactivity to um, different foods. So it's a very complex area. I think it's true to say that we're just starting uh, to understand it. So it's breaking news, really. And I think um, you'll see a number of the uh, speakers that come to the uh, Earl of Stanlaw Society, but even back in Ghent, um, we had a speaker talk, go into great depth about this, and that's available, I think, for you to, to look at. Uh, it's incredibly complex, uh, and we're only just starting to uh, unpick things like celiac, um, carbohydrates, um, all of the mast cell activation, all of these things is... I mean, it's exciting times for, for those who are academic. It's not so good for people who are right in the middle of it, working their way through. And I think it's true that most of my patients uh, work their way through to some kind of tolerable um, existence. Uh, but it's very, very difficult. And you never know quite when you're going to bump into something unexpectedly that's going to knock you out for days. Um, so a yeah, very good question, but uh, no simple answers. At lunchtime, I noticed there was about a third, approximately, that were for the special di dietary requirements. So I don't know if a lot of people are figuring it out for themselves that it's maybe having an impact. Um, but the second one, if, if that's okay, um, was about time management. Um, it was slightly touched on. Um, if this is an actual problem within people, um, within the EDS community, um, I noticed, again, there was a lot of late comers, and I'm notoriously late. Everywhere I go, I'm late. Um, I normally try and laugh it off, but it is, it's embarrassing. It causes a lot of problems. Um, but it's really whether or not this is like the actual physical, physical challenges of the condition as it's constantly changing. One day it takes 10 minutes to have a shower, the next day it takes an hour. So it's managing the time that way. Or is it an actual condition of time blindness? Um, it's just to see what the feedback on that was. Um, yeah, I, I would say, I would say the, um, the time management problems seem to be universal. Um, my experience of this particular um, population is that time management does tend to be related to physical mobility and physical limitations, trying to get around. So, it, so while we can think about time management, particularly for people in relation to their work, um, from my experience, it doesn't necessarily, it can do, but it doesn't tend to come up much deeper than that. Um, because it can go back to your childhood, but it doesn't tend to go much deeper than that in this population. So from my experience, it, just, it does tend to be because of the physical limitations around the body. That's great. It's a relief to hear that. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Hi, um, sorry. I think um, one question I'd like to ask is, I think a lot of people here would have spent a, a lot of money um, in the end trying to source the right doctors for their conditions. Um, and it's knowing when to stop, when, when to actually, when to actually realize that actually we're not gonna get any further with the NHS at the moment and we need to take this in our own hands and take a bit of ownership until we can then move everyone forward and bring everyone together. And I was wondering, have you got any advice what the best way is to c collaborate everyone that you're trying to work with together? Bring everybody together. Yeah. So, um, so um, 
as somebody who's worked in the NHS for many, many years and now works privately, I have huge amounts of sympathy with regards to um, access to people. And, and uh, we see this both within, uh, within the doctor side of things, the therapist side of things, podiatry. Um, there are certain types of techniques that aren't even available on the NHS, well, right? Two, two pain clinics. <laughs> two pain clinics. Um, it. So it's a very real phenomenon. One of, the, one of the pieces of work that we've been trying to do as um, several groups, HMSA, EDS UK, the work we're doing with uh, the others, Danlos Society, is at, at multiple levels work with the NHS to try and improve the understanding uh, the commissioning of services. So at one level, we're right up there talking to very senior commissioners at, uh, at NHS England. At another level, well, let's not call it levels, in one place, um, we're, we're talking to commissioners about how we, how we improve services. In another place, people like Philip are going around um, Kent and educating and training and bringing networks together. Um, uh, we have the ECHO program that we're running, which is this all teach, all learn education program that anybody can jump onto from anywhere, whether they're NHS or private, it doesn't matter. We have master classes running uh, up and down the country. Um, so these are, all, these are all ways that we're trying to sort of facilitate the development of much greater skills within a multidisciplinary team. Does it take a very long time? Yes. Even in the private sector, Professor Graham's still here, it took, it, it took an extremely long time for us to gather our network together. Um, but we had to start somewhere. And we're working closely with colleagues all over the country where they may be the catalyst for something. Philip was the catalyst for something in Kent. Maybe just sort of share your experience of what's happened in Kent over the last couple of years as, a, as an example of what, what can happen. Yes, I mean, I've probably spoken to about 1,000 health professionals in Kent, including 200 GPs. And we give them this clear sort of outline of the questions you need to ask, the things to look for, and the simple things that you can do in primary care, like you know, if you've got POTS, take more, more fluid, more salt. Simple things uh, that make big differences. And things like mindfulness, uh, things like Alexander Technique, which we have got in our pain clinic. We've got Alexander teachers there. And, and, it, and kind of uh, increasing the, um, the toolkit and all three charities have been enormously helpful in, in allowing us to say, right, go and look at this, or there's this conference, come to Ghent, you know, whatever, whatever it is, it's, it's out there. One thing I did want to say about medical progress is that Alan and I have been through a period of time with a different condition known as rheumatoid, which we've got much greater understanding about. When we started, um, certainly when I started in, in 1980s, there wasn't really an effective treatment for an, you know, for a, a, an incurable condition. And at every, every, every clinic, you would have three people in wheelchairs uh, who have just had totally destroyed joints. Uh, the picture has changed over my lifetime in, in the NHS to something which is now eminently treatable. And although we don't know enough about this condition, um, there, there is cause for optimism because so much international uh, understanding is, um, and research is going on that I think it's... You, there is cause for optimism for the future because things do change in medicine. And I, I, and I think it, it, um, uh, to build an army you need one or two leaders and everywhere that we've been um, where we have successfully started to develop programs and networks there's usually been one or two people who have been catalysts and they might come from uh, doctors or therapists or uh, you know, other people. So if you know in your area of, of, of people that are sort of uh, in the middle of, in the thick of this, but don't have a lot of support around them. That's where we were 10, 15 years where colleagues are now. It's, it's okay to start somewhere with very little and build. And one of the opportunities that we now have with the way we can network using virtual groups and everything else is that that is so much easier to do in terms of having conversations with each other. A colleague of mine took a masterclass on physiotherapy up to uh, northeast England uh, last week, two weeks ago, uh, when we were at a staff meeting and she ran a full program there. Uh, fantastic. Loads of people there that were grappling with all the sorts of things that we've been talking about today. And I dialed in from five hours behind on the east coast of the States and joined in and we all had a really good conversation. These things are easily done. Um, it just requires people locally to have an interest and if they are a catalyst, get them, get them to get them to contact us.
I just want to say thank you because I, I think it's about pulling the whole families together. We've talked a lot today about patient having that psychological support, but I also think it's very important for our partners too as well because you know they're not just dealing with one; they could be dealing with children as well, and this up and down of you know the ADHD type of symptoms as well on top. And um, I just want to say thank you for the whole day anyway. Thank you. Uh, off the back of that, I just wanted to ask, as we're here in Edinburgh and this particular country has a pretty poor demographic of um, EDS clinicians, is there any advice you can give to patients in Scotland, specifically people who are desperate? I would say one piece of advice that I would give to anyone in Scotland and anyone listening from all over the world is tell your the professionals, your GP surgeons about EDS Echo that we've set up because that was set up to create a 1,000 EDS experts by 2022 by this all teach, all learn model that's free to take part in. People can dial in from anywhere where they are in the world, present their de-identified case studies that could be people like you sitting in this room to talk to experts to find out what the best care is for those people. And through that process, that's how you, you create more experts because there's actually no such thing as an EDS expert. It doesn't exist. You have rheumatologists, geneticists, gastroenterologists, you know, and on and on and on. And they are individuals that have taken an interest in this condition and been willing to educate themselves. And that's all we need, all around the world, more and more, because we still have a small collection of these experts that have dedicated their careers often to this condition, and for that we're so grateful, but we need many more. And everyone can help us do that and build that army of experts because it's not impossible. Um, it just requires their willingness to learn. And can, yeah, can I tell you a little story about somebody who was brave enough to come down from Scotland to see me in Kent? And um, that initial consultation, I was able to kind of outline certain things that she needed to do. Um, and I know that Julia has seen her. <laughs> Um, uh, and uh, so she's had some Alexander lessons in Edinburgh um, and um, I, I then reached out to my gastro colleagues because that was a big thing. I said, who do you know in Edinburgh who could deal with this? And so, um, by the, by, so there was just two examples of uh, kind of remote control and she's doing really well. Um, so um, I think as our network increases and a similar story from a, a ballet dancer who came to me who, who was going back to... Um, to um, Madrid, um, or was it Barcelona? And I said, uh, I know somebody in Barcelona, there's a professor out there, and we were able to plug that individual into the hypermobility network in Barcelona. So uh, it's networking that I think makes the difference. Yeah, absolutely. Um, um, I can't do this this afternoon. <laughs> That's it. I've got, I've got some kind of motor dysfunction. Um, <laughs> Uh, so, uh, absolutely about the networking, and we're growing and growing that network, and um, part of uh, the work that we're doing is, uh, is e extending the kind of international um, consortium with all of the expertise, and it's, in it's incredible once you do know. I feel, sometimes I feel like a yellow pages, so people will come down to me in London, and they'll say, you know, how are we going to do this? I actually already have many, many contacts. What I can't understand is why those contacts don't know each other locally. And I think one of, the, one, one of the things that we need to try and do is get them networking closer together. However, you know, however we can facilitate that. So network, network, network. We do know the people. We know, I, I know there are people uh, up here um, and because I'm referring people back up here all the time. Um, but the other piece uh, is the whole um, conversation with NHS Scotland uh, and commissioning. And some of you will know from last year that this conversation did start and NHS Scotland was looking at some of its data, which is the information it has on um, patients that are being transferred down to England for assessment. And I know that conversation is still happening. Um, I did promise a couple of people who asked me a very similar question earlier on that I will email uh, the colleagues that I've been in touch with because they've spent time with me um, starting those sorts of questions. And it was one of those catalysts. So this isn't a clinical catalyst, this is a service delivery commissioning catalyst, and it started. 
it will take a long time, I have no doubt, because these things do. But there is, there is this kind of undercurrent of work that's going on. And, and to remind you all that we do have our medical directory and we do have people from Scotland on there. So it's worth checking that out and uh, seeing if there's anyone uh, local to where can you I, are. Can I just add as well, if, um, if you're in sort of this area or north, north of England, we're very happy, and if you're interested in finding out about the Alexander Technique, we're really happy to organise some workshops for people to get together and uh, you know, find, find out what it's all about. See, there's a lot of people willing, you know, when we published the 2017 criteria, there were 90 people in the consortium, there's now 140, that's just in, in two short years, so it, it, it's growing, it is changing, We're all, we've all got, as a community PTSD of this whole process of 20 years of no updated nosology, no real research, no funding, you know, and there is hope on the horizon now, it's just going to take a really long time to repair that damage that was done over such a long period of time. I've got time for two very quick more questions, so up there and then to the middle. Hello. <laughs> um, so I have a question um, regarding children. I have EDS myself. I was diagnosed three years ago. Um, recently, my daughter has displayed some symptoms, um, which she was referred to our local rheumatologist at the Sick Kids in Glasgow. Um, they said that she was a normal, healthy girl um, with nothing wrong with her, even though her collarbones um, dislocating, her shoulders, etc., other things. Um, so I took her to see Professor Chikanza in July of this year, and she was given a, a diagnosis there. Going back to the GP um, from seeing Professor Chikanza, he had asked for some specific tests to be done on my daughter, some extra bloods. Um, and the GP, after seeing him and read the professor's letter, he said there was a, a marked contrast between the local NHS rheumatologist and Professor Chikanza's letter, um, and that if I didn't mind, could he re-refer her for a second opinion? Uh, we were there yesterday, and again, we were met with the same sort of attitude that um, she was quite normal. They agreed that she did need physiotherapy of some sort, um, but they said that there was a whole buzz, was, was the correct word, around EDS at the moment, which obviously is what you're trying to create, is a buzz and an awareness, which we all know. Um, but she said that she was unwilling to acknowledge that she had EDS. She didn't think she had it. She wasn't going to label her with anything. She didn't believe in the bait and score assessment for children. Um, I'm aware of the statement that came out from the, is it the British Society of Rheumatologists? I know that there was um, a letter sent back from yourself and EDS UK. So really my question is, does anybody know why there's such a reluctancy to um, diagnose a child? Um, and why there seems to be this problem that they don't have anything wrong with them. Um, because in, you know, today's all about the psychological and emotional health and I feel that telling a child that they're perfectly normal, um, when my daughter's had to give up a dancing career, etc., she can't do certain things. What does that do to her mental health um, to say that she's normal? And what, you know, we don't have any services available. And one of the letters that was written that I had a shopping list um, and that they were worried about me trying to get a medical diagnosis for her. Um, so as, again, we come back to the sort of child protection sort of issue. Um, so it was really just to see whether anybody knew why the NHS rheumatologists are unwilling to, to address this. Yeah. I think it is a real problem. I think it's probably the case that a lot of children who are hypermobile, uh, that it goes away by the age of 14. That's what the paediatricians are, are saying. Um, and that group, who don't go on to get anything more complicated, could be reasonably reassured. But the problem is, how do you know when it's an eight-year-old which way they're going to go? And um, Alan and I spend a lot of our time at the end, seeing 25-year-olds who've had clues all along the way from a, that kind of paediatric contact and then an orthopedic contract, contact with subluxing kneecaps 
and then an irritable bowel consultation with a gastroenterologist being fully investigated. And then all the way on the background, there's been something suggestive of mast cell activation. And then they end up with, with us. So looking back, it's easy to say, well, why, why couldn't anyone have put this together? And I think that's a lot of what we're trying to do is get the, the adult um, specialist at least to see those, um, see those links. But with, with kids, it's, it's, um, it's another story. I've got um, um, two grandchildren. And uh, my daughter-in-law is very hypermobile, and uh, my grandson, who is three, is not at all hypermobile. But my granddaughter, who is one, is extremely hypermobile. Now, knowing what I know, I'm not too worried about her because she's walking and she's really active. And I suppose at the moment, what we're trying to do is say, don't protect those kids to the extent that they don't participate in exercise. Kids do better when they do more. But it's a very complicated area and we don't have the answers. And you are right that pedi some, some of our paediatric colleagues don't quite get it right. I've got one paediatrician in Kent who doesn't believe in POTS. Um, where, 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 do, where, do you, where do you start? It is complicated. Absolutely. I mean, I think, um, so these are definitely other areas that we want to explore when we start our rounds of discussions with our paediatric colleagues. But we also have uh, pedi paediatricians, uh, paediatric general physicians uh, and, um, uh, and rheumatologists in our consortium. Uh, and we are exploring all of these areas very much. And, and the message that I, that I get across, uh, that comes across to me from them, I think time and time again in particular is um, in the younger children, um, up typically say up to the age of nine or 10, it can be very, very difficult to be clear what the diagnosis is but that should never stop you treating whatever the problem is. So treat the problem, not the diagnosis, is a sort of way forward. Um, and I can see the sense in that, because it can be very difficult to know whether um, a younger child will go on to fully develop many of the features of, say, hypermobile EDS, as opposed to the functional issues in the there and then, which may be very physical, which would be very typical of themselves of hypermobility spectrum disorder. But actually, if you, if you spend your time almost concerned about the diagnosis and don't actually clock that you've got a youngster in front of you with a set of symptoms that's having a functional impact, then you've kind of missed the point because this problem doesn't go away. Now, the other thing just to bear in mind is that actually we've had... So the British Society for Rheumatology has... has um, uh, revised its guidance that it wrote in 2013 and that came out very recently and um, broadly speaking it's it's useful it's got lots of very sensible suggestions and it would be good to see whether those suggestions have actually been worked through um, to be confident um, that actually the set that the, the whole assessment's been done the other thing to bear in mind is that um, the College of Pediatrics and Child Health has actually endorsed the 2017 international criteria for a diagnosis of hypermobile EDS. So if the signs are there and the diagnosis is endorsed by going through the criteria, then that is the diagnosis. And the issue that you then have is you're possibly working with somebody who doesn't know that level of knowledge. So it's a, it's a, it's a knowledge gap. Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you.